Hello, oh, this is Haku the Bean, and today we are going to be tumbling. If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. Now let's get right into this. You know what? Frick you! Runs your cast iron pan through a dishwasher or cycle. My seasoning. The worst part about being an adult is that it's no longer socially acceptable to just roll down a really big hill and run back up it and roll back down again. Oh, is this a syphilis metaphor? <laughs> Passive, I would ask, is this for a TikTok? No! I just want to come home covered in dirt and scratches and bask in the solace of childlike mirth. Everyone unreblogging un this without the addition and commenting, OP, did you mean Sisyphus? Yes. Yes, I did. No! Syphilis met for now! Frick you. It still does suck. You just can't do childish things anymore. The world is awful. Image. <sighs> Yay, another long a freaking picture. Just one big picture. I love Cutthroat Kitchen, but binge watching make makes it really stand out how often Alton Brown refers to himself as daddy and makes contestants wear spreader bars. Okay. Oh jeez. Whose money will be returning home to daddy? You heard me! Our general purpose adjustable spray bar are, are, are number 7002. It's just F2002 featured on Foodworks, Food Network's Cutthroat Kitchen. Ballistic Metal USA. Precision crafted gear proudly made in the USA. Cut. <sighs> Special rings, BDSM. Plugs. No fun devices. Shower play. Spreader bars. Bondage. Naughty toys. Whips and paddles. I can't believe I now know where to buy the exact fetch gear they use on my favorite cooking show. <laughs> A generic revenge. Okay, but why the fuck are you using spare bars on a cooking show? Does that make it kind of hard to cook? I think that's kind of the point. Chef Yaku must wear pumpkin on his head. Oh. Chef Uda. Tools replaced with cowboy gear. Oh. Kinda, yeah. So, this is intentional. Data's vibrating robot dong. This seems like your, your, your speed. That logo looks familiar. Prince Namar, the submariner. Oh gosh, that looks... What? No way. Oh my god. This pose is everything. Cutthroat kitchen, BDSM gear, comics, 
Art theft. We met Alton Brown at a show he did here. We paid the extra cash to meet him and get a blurry cell phone pic with him and have him sign a picture. He knows my male companion's pocket watch and proceeds to order him to take it out of his pocket. It wasn't obnoxious. It was in a dumb tone that brooked no argument. So he complied when he found out it wasn't wound. So not working. He was deeply disappointed and told him to do better next time. If this guy isn't a dom, I'll eat that spreader bar. What a terrible way to find out your friend is a bottom. Yeah, meeting a celebrity, they, they do the, the, the dom thing, and then you learn that your friend is a bottom. That's great. And also, that was almost the worst guy I posed I could have read on in the first like five minutes of the video. What the heck? These two twins were famous for having a stranger to death and from their boyfriends and also twins in this American classic film. What is, um, what is Gay Boy City? That's Japanese correct! Oh yeah, I'm not playing the freaking music. Don't, don't even ask. One, I find that anime music just absolutely annoying. And two... I'm not looking to get hit with copyright strikes, you know? Okay, what's this about? This is gonna be funny too. Why didn't they just leave Pompeii when the volcano erupted? Were they stupid? Fun fact! They did leave Pompeii. It's estimated that the population of eruption was something like 20k. And the most likely number of dead is in the range of 1500 to 4,000. So, so most people just did leave Pompeii. It's just that not everyone left or could leave. Prior Classic Flow. A power classic flow, also known as a power classic density current or power classic cloud, is a fast moving current of hot gas volcanic matter, collectively known as tephra, that flows along the ground away from a volcano at average speeds of 100 km per or hour, 30 meters per second, or 62 miles per hour. But it's capable of reaching speeds of up to 700 km per hour, 190 meters per second, or 435 miles per hour. The gas in Typhoid can reach temperatures of about 1000 degrees Celsius or 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. Prior classic flows sweep down the flanks of a May on volcano Philippines. I'd still, I'd have still left the human body is capable of wonderful old things in the face of danger. A lot of people died in the boats too. I would have had a wife quickly. <laughs> uh, pyroclastic flow is hot enough to kill a human in just a few seconds. It's also why Mount St. Helens was so deadly. Volcanoes are terrifying, unstoppable forces of nature. I think like pretty hot bad, so I think I'd be able to last no longer than the average person. Oh my goodness. The scariest thing about pyroclastic flow is that if you could see it, no matter how far away it is, there is no possible way of surviving. I've done incredible things. I think you'd be surprised. Have you considered that the way... Hey, the eruption worked, meant they didn't have the fucking time to run? Like all the bodies of Hercule, 
in, in the, um, were found at the docks. They were waiting for rescue by the sea, and a boiling cloud of poisonous gas killed them all while they were sleeping. So no, they weren't stupid, they were just dealing with one of the most catastrophic events of human history, with none of the knowledge of how an eruption worked and no mo an evacuation plan. I know a lot about the volcano. They could learn much from me. You should teach them. I will. It's understandable that constantly being in the basement makes you unaware of what's going on in the outside world. Natural disasters still happen all over the world. Pompeii isn't the only one. So when you call victims from any natural disaster stupid, you're implying that dying in one makes you stupid. Why are people dying in hurricanes? They know it's coming. Why are they just running away? It's disrespectful for the victims, families, and friends of the victim uh, to call all them stupid. Everyone who has ever died from anything is an idiot. I wouldn't have done that. The force of the explosion was enough to shatter people's skeletons inside their bodies, by the way. Absolutely free. It's terrifying. I've never recovered from learning that. Perhaps it could be chalked up to poor diet? I don't think explosions alone can do this. I, I freaking love that this person is like, oh yeah, people died in a natural disaster. That sounds like a freaking skill issue. Their skeletons exploded. That's on them. Okay. Their brains ends became aerosols in their skulls. What? No. Correct, some of their brain cells turn into glass because, as you want to bitch about the Smith, it's still in its knowledge base. That doesn't sound correct. They should verify this information. The pyroclastic flow that killed everyone Pompeii and Her Herculaneum. Killed them so fast they didn't have time to register what was happening. They died of thermal shock from the extreme temperatures. As for why they didn't leave, many of them did, as stated above. But others are not because Vesuvius had not erupted for approximately 1800 years. I feel like this all could have been a boy if they ran or dosed it faster is all. I don't think it had to be like that. <laughs> that is such a bait account. Oh my goodness. Ooh. <sighs> A hot take for your consideration, writing Superman as some edgelord fascist that wants to dominate everyone. A la Injustice or a Superman and, and stand in, as such says more about the writer than whatever it is they're actually trying to talk about, from society. Actually, fun fact. I think I remember hearing this a while ago, like long ago when I was younger. Um, Superman was actually written by survivors of... Uh, World War II, the concentration camps. Apparently, Superman is based on uh, you know who, the person in charge of uh, Germany at the time, or uh, the person that caused all these stuff that Germany was doing. I'm not sure if he was really in charge. I didn't really look into it. But if he were a good person and had superpowers, it really all comes down to one question, and a no holds barred power or fantasy. What do you do? For Superman, the answer was pretty, pretty much always been that he, he does everything he can to help everyone he can as much as he can. He is grade A, top shelf, go to shoes, boy scout. But writers like to write Superman, or their Superman standing as either not realizing exams or part hours or undergoing some traumatic event and then going edgelord fascist mode. To me at least, none of these ever seemed wholly plausible in the case of the former. Superman has never been under the illusion that he's weak. Why do you think he's become a superhero in the first place? In the case of the latter, he's got a wide circle of friends to help him grieve and process his emotions in a healthy way. Is he gonna beat himself up over it? Yeah, no shit he is. But he's not gonna decide the 
solution is to kill everyone who steps out of line. He may be stronger than everyone else, but as a superhero, he has a responsibility to restrain his power. I.e. not to kill anyone. And he knows this. Truth be told, all that I think Inktis says about the writer is that either A. The no holds barred power fantasy is, be is to become an edgelord fascist and dominate everyone. Or B. They're hopelessly pessimistic. There is a prevalent misconception, and especially in comic writing, that gritty or edgy equals realistic. So my conclusion is that they believe that Superman, or Superman like ND, becoming edgelord fascist is more realistic than becoming the gooders of Samaritans. Because even if the latter is right, the former is easier. Everyone thinks what's easy over what's right. Right? Well, no. The same goes for a lot of superheroes. It would be easy to be the bad guy, but that doesn't make it right. Pro tip for writing military characters. Do not give them a badass nickname. Literally every military nickname is either an insult or a reminder of an embarrassing incident. For example, my nickname was Firehouse because I once got really drunk and pissed myself. I'm not ashamed to admit this because everyone I knew with the nickname had a similarly embarrassing origin. Mine was Rat because I was short for the army and ugly. Wow! <laughs> That had to hurt. <laughs> I love this. As someone who says like this, I will never not laugh when someone says that word doesn't exist. <laughs> like my good bitch. If a word is regularly used by certain amount of people, then it exists. If it has its own grammatical rules, then it's perfectly valid. It's far too long, Scott. Now, sweetie, it's a made-up word, honey. All words are made up. Ling linguists don't freaking excavate Athens. Then and freak just fucking excavate Athens, and we're like, behold, vocabulary. That word isn't a dictionary. Dictionaries are not rule books; they're record books. Refrigerate didn't exist until two hundred years ago. Yet here we are. A language that doesn't adapt to an ever-changing society is bound to be lost because eventually. You won't be able to keep up with social progress, you motherfuckers. I love this. <sighs> Obsessed where Oh, sorry. Obsessed with stories where it is like the mistakes are unfixable and the worst thing that could happen and happen and nothing can go back to how it was. But there was still love in this and love will continue after this and love endures always. I love when tragedies are like the love was there. It didn't change anything. It didn't save anyone. There were just too many forces against it. But it still matters that the love was there. The Natural Companion post, my favorite post. Hell yeah. Beautiful. What? I had a dream that Pepsi released a candy called Pepsi Particles that were caviar, caviar, caviar size, a spherical Pepsi logos that fizz in your mouth. The packaging was a blue and silver pouch with a Pepsi logo surrounded. It was rings like an atom. There are crystal of Pepsi and Pepsi blue flavors as well. I can't stop thinking about out them. Okay, so candy that fizzes in your mouth. That seems familiar. Oh yeah, Pop Rocks. I remember having those when I was a kid. Kind of uh, were already kind of out of fashion by the time I had them. They kind of were a thing, like, I think in the 90s, early 2000s, kind of lost popularity, and I'm not even sure if they're a thing anymore now.
I don't think people realize how hard it is to rediscover the person you were before depression, or even try to remember your own personality. And if you've had depression since ch early childhood, you don't even know if you have your own personality. You didn't have time to be a person before depression, and it's scary having no idea who you are. Very true, very true. We're going to move on because I don't, I don't, I don't like how relatable this is. Watching movie at home circa like 2001 was like, put your TV on channel 2 so the VCR will work. Open up the clamshell okay so how the VHS has had that has that satisfying prick put in the movie. God damn it has to be rewound. Press stop and then rewind because it's so much faster that way. Start the movie over. And it takes a few seconds for me to actually start because you were already wound to the very beginning. FBI will, will, will get you to will legally distribute or exhibit this movie. And then because you forgot that movies are always so much louder than TV. Coming soon to own on video and DVD! Quick, load the volume, load the volume, load the volume. Oh fuck! Okay, guys, so we're ready. Oh, these ads are kind of quiet, a little high to hear. I turn up the volume. T H X. I can't make the noise. You know the noise. You know the noise. If you are above the age of like ten, you know the damn noise. Don't forget about the time Jeremy took a live actor, said it's caucus of inches, and the machine confirmed that's true. Don't forget about the time that we learned that lie detectors are a whole bunch of junk that actually go off for plants who don't have heartbeats. Crazy. Are you okay? No, I'm living in a country run by freaking clowns. This is probably the most inclusive post ever made on Tumblr. What country is this about? Yes. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, long one. Let's go. I think it's almost time for me to call the video oh, oh, to an end. Especially with noises getting louder downstairs. Y'all think the gods take classics classes for fun? Professor, why does your drawing look like that? At lol, a Tervis would be paler. Apollo, twin sister to Tervis, has seen her at least once a week for 4,000 years. Hmm. Professor, Ares is the god of war and it's evil. Ares, you sure about that? Professor, Hades is the god of the underworld and is therefore evil and cold and heartless. I imagine that before it cut off, because someone doesn't know how to craft right, there was going to be a response on, on to Hades being like, Oh please, you're being dramatic. I am not evil, cold, or heartless. I care a lot. I just have to deal with the dead instead of the living. You and your stereotypes because I happen to work in the, in the world of the dead. <clears throat> Kevin versus Quantum Mechanics. This is an autobiography piece. Names have been changed for un an un an 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 I hate these words, but it's otherwise left be. The class's first suspicion of Kevin was that he had somehow cheated his way up to this course. 
He just seemed perpetually confused, strangely antagonistic of the professor. The weirdest example of this was when he asked what an ion was in a third year EE class and was a form that referred to any positively or negatively charged article. It would have been strange enough to ask, but his reply of either, that doesn't sound right, suited him in as a well known character in a class of 19 people. Yeah, I don't think an ion is either. I think it's proton and um, electron and neutron, but maybe I'm a little bit silly. The real tipping point of our perception of him having done a lecture where the professor mentioned practical uses for a neutron beam and Kevin asked if a beam could be made out of some other earned neutral material. When asked like what, he answered, atom with all of its electrons removed. When we point out that protons would make, make that abomination entirely possibly a charge, he replied with, so what I'd have removed those two? And there and it was after when we informed him that I would just be neutrons. That's high school level chemistry. Not knowing it was so incredibly strange that I felt like something was off. So I asked him if he'd like to grab lunch. He accepted, we chatted, and I finally began to get a sense of his origin story. Why is this read like a red puzzle that's supposed to be an autobiography? See, Kevin wasn't a junior, a senior electrical engineer like the rest of us. Kevin was, in fact, three noble things. A business major, a sophomore, and a hardcore or Catholic. All three of those are essential to understanding his scenario. What had begun all of this was actually a conflict with Kevin and his roommate. Kevin frequently had his fundamental belief in absolute good, absolute bad, and absolute anything pushed back had uh, gone by his roommate who was in STEM. Said roommate kept invoking quantum mechanics as his proof against absolute knowledge. Kevin was tired of, of having something he didn't understand thrown at his convictions, so he decided to take a quantum course to sell things once and for all. Despite not having any of, of the prerequisites, he had actually tried to take quantum um, physics for physicists first, but the C physics department wouldn't let him. It's actually pretty strictly regulated because it's a mandatory class for physics majors. However, because quantum is not mandatory for electrical engineers, there aren't really any built-in requirements for the class. It's assumed that no one would actually try to take it until their third year, because doing so would be the mental equivalent to slamming your nuts in a car door. Just pure suffering for no or good reason. <laughs> I love that. That's a really good uh, an analogy. Apparently, the counselors had tried to talk him out of it, but if Kevin was one thing, it was sovereign. He'd actually had to sign some papers basically saying, I was warned that this is incredibly stupid, but I refuse to listen or in order to take the class. He was actually pretty nice. If you're only aware of how bad he just fucked up, I gave her lunch, wishing him, wish him the best, and reported back to the class. That's the score. We'd all been curious about this guy's story, but now that I had the truth, I could share with the world. Oh jeez, how many of these are there? Feelings were mixed. Some people thought that he was going to drop out any minute now. Others thought that he wouldn't be... He, he also that convincing him to drop now while he still could was the only ethical thing. Others figured that a policy of non-interference was best. The counselor is going to dissuade him, if, and if we try to do the same, he'd probably think it was a stem elitism trying to guard its little clubhouse. He forgot how hard things were, or he'd fail. Either way, it would help him learn more about the world. We wound up taking the approach of non-interference. If nothing else, understanding his origins gave us more patience when he asked bizarre questions. He wasn't trying to waste our time, he was just trying to cram three years of free rights into a one-semester course. 
He did get a little a bit combative sometimes because he thought that he was really wrecking his brain to try and find some sort of contradiction or error that he could use to bring the whole thing down. But he never could. Perseus came by and he bombed it, completely unprepared. He'd taken Calc, but he didn't know how to do integrals yet. That was as Calc too. Worse, he was far past the drop grade. I imagine most people in his shoes would have stopped struggling. They'd realize they were fucked and let themselves up as fell. At least salvaging their other classes is great in the process. Why waste resources on an unwinnable battle? Kevin never asked questions like that. If he was stupid enough to try it, he was stupid enough to finish it. God bless him. He invited me to lunch after the test and said that the class was more fascinating than you'd ever imagined. But he didn't know if he'd, he'd be able to pass it. He asked if I could help and I said, maybe. I brought the request to the Discord and from the eight people that ever I got three volunteers who admired the historic and last day, he was in over his head, miles beneath the service, but his fighting spirit was fucking glorious. If he was willing to go down swinging, we were willing to bust our asses trying to get him caught up. Some of the stuff was just extra homework we gave to, gave to the guy. We told him he needs to learn integrals, stat. We sent him some copies of basic software that can be used to teach the, the, the basics of linear circuit equations. And he practiced that, that game like it was Halo. Just hours sunk into it. Absolutely godlike. He was still scrabbling for error, or, or just at the surface level of the class, but he'd gone from abysmal failure to lingering on the boundary between life and death. Everyone in the class started to learn about Kevin's origin story, and our little circle of four volunteer tutors grew to six. Every day he had done something, he had someone trying to help him catch up in some way or finish that week's homework. He'd gone, he'd gone from being seen as a nuisance. I wasted class time to the underdog mascot. He was getting 12 hours of personal tutoring a week on top of 3 hours of classes. On top of 6 hours of office hours. On top of the coursework. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that this kid was doing 40 hours a week just trying to pass this one single class. Really hard to read when the stuff covers, is it? Second test comes around and he gets a 60. He's ecstatic. We're ecstatic. Kid's too young to take dr out drinking. And, and so we just order pizza and cheer or like he just won gold at the Olympics. After that second test, things hit another tipping point. With so much catch up under his belt, he was able to focus a lot more on the actual material for the class. A borderline cinematic moment happened when I was trying to get ahead on homework so that I could put more hours on my senior project. Nobody else had finished it yet because it wasn't due for another week, so the specifics of the problem I was working on were still a mystery. I went to the professor's office as hours and got it on some posters. But he wasn't willing to give good hints when the homework wasn't due for another week or so. He, s he said I still had time to think about it, which was true. But I want on uh, to be able to think about other things. Kevin had watched the whole conversation, waiting for his son to ask the professor more simple questions. But when I left, I got a text from him saying to, so I'm going to hop on soon. Kevin had finished it early because Kevin started all of his homework the moment of it was assigned. He needed to in order to make sure that he could get it done on time. He finished it the day before and was able to walk me through it. From student to teacher. I'm not exaggerating when I say that. He probably saved me 8 hours on that assignment. I could have kissed him. A month or two later, we took the final. As soon as we were done, we asked Kevin how he did. He was nervous. There was so much new material for him I'm in this class and his retention had been great. Us six were also a little, a little stressed. We were going to pass the class, but the final was hard. We waited for the results, and waited, and waited. Finally, the scores were... ...are posted as a table. Curve included, for our class of 19 people, Four withdrew within the deadline, four failed, one got a C, eight 
it got B's and two got A's. We can see the curve uh, for C was set at 59.2% overall. We caught Kevin. He started crying. End score. 59.2%. Teacher curved the C exactly to his score. It was a week into winter break, so we couldn't and gather the forces around for a party like last time. But we were all losing our shit. Kevin was losing his shit. He couldn't believe how stupid he was to try this course. He couldn't believe that six people busted their ass just to make sure he didn't die. And he couldn't believe that the professor basically just passed him out of sheer effort alone. He said it was the stupidest thing he'd ever done. And while I doubt that, it was outrageously stupid. And yet, I've never been so bad as the NFL scene before. I'm proud of Kevin's seat and I am of my own B. I always walk on sunshine for or weeks after that. In theory, my senior project was building a functioning washing machine. But in practice, in my heart, it was helping in Kevin and pass intro to quantum for electrical engineers. Ah, I can't read the bottom. Hang on. I hate when people do that stupid texting on the bottom because it can't be read. As an epilogue, no, he did not renounce Catholicism and become an atheist like his roommate had hoped. He did walk out changed. I think that being that wrong about something and realizing it was a pivotal moment for him. It, it's hard to be dogmatic until you realize that a lifetime being wrong feels exactly like a lifetime being right. Right up until the two the last two seconds of it. <sighs> that was an inspiring story. Let's do a short one on on for or, or, or good luck. What would classic literature to literature do without the attic? Where else can you who store a secret first wife, a cursed portrait, and a woman, and having a hallucination about yellow wallpaper? Cellars, obviously. Can't the cellar is full of amontillado? Where I don't see it. Just down here. Come this way, and I'll show you. For the love of God, the title says it all, really. Dang, that was a long one. Anyway, if you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. I have absolutely no idea what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, so until then, goodbye!